Welcome to the Headache Doctor Podcast, where it's our mission to educate and empower everyone with headaches and migraines so that you can break free from a life of fear of your next headache or migraine and dependence on medication, allowing you to thrive in everything you do. Hello and welcome to the Headache Doctor Podcast, where it's our mission to educate and empower everyone with headaches and migraines so that you can break free from a life of fear of your next headache or migraine and dependence on medication. In today's podcast, we're going to be talking about cervicogenic headaches. What is a cervicogenic headache? How do you know if you have a cervicogenic headache? And why does it even matter? Well, the why that does it even matter part is going to potentially unleash a lot of opportunity as far as what treatment could look like. And so I'm excited to dive into that, but we have to lay the framework of what is a cervicogenic headache, why is it overlooked, and then we'll branch into the practical aspects of what this means for you. Pretty much anyone listening to this podcast, which I'm assuming either you or a loved one, or maybe you're just interested in headaches or migraines, but pretty much everyone listening to this, I'm assuming, is uh, connected, uh, first degree, second degree, to someone that has headaches if you don't personally have them yourself. Headaches or migraines. Now, any type of head or facial pain, when you experience those symptoms, the first thing that pops to your mind is what is actually causing this. Now, the what is actually causing this is clo- is it's tied closely to the different diagnoses that we receive. So it's assumed that if you have the diagnosis, that will explain what is actually happening. Well, as you all well know, that is not the case. When you have migraine symptoms, you receive the diagnosis of migraine, but it doesn't actually tell you what's happening, all right? So we wanna understand what is happening in someone's situation. What could actually be causing the underlying, what's the underlying problem that's causing your symptoms? Well, when we look at the different diagnoses, the many, many diagnoses that are connected to headaches or migraines, so that's a long list at the top is migraine, migraine with aura, migraine without aura, tension type headaches, cluster headaches, and then we go down the list. Well, cervicogenic headache is relatively low on the list, meaning it's not very commonly diagnosed. And there's a few reasons for that. But when we talk about getting to the source of what's happening, it is a diagnosis that provides hope. The reason being, we can we can find the hope in the name itself, so cervicogenic. So when you're looking for what is actually causing my symptoms, this is known as a secondary type of headache, meaning there's a problem in our body that is then causing pain. So there's a problem in our neck that's causing a headache. So cervico refers to the cervical spine, which is the neck. And then genic refers to just the origin. So something originating in the neck, a headache originating in the neck. So essentially it's just saying, I have a neck problem that's now leading to a headache. So if you have a diagnosis of cervicogenic headache, you're basically communicating that you have a neck problem that presents itself as head pain. Now, it's interesting because at Novera Headache Center, most of the people that come to see us have the diagnosis of migraine. Mostly what we're working on, and I would say in nearly 100% of people, so a very high percentage, it's mainly the neck, and then secondary is gonna be jaw, shoulder tension. Now, it's almost never that someone comes through a process, has a diagnosis of migraine, and doesn't have a neck problem. So what we're gonna talk about is, how do all these people with migraine symptoms have neck problems, and why aren't they diagnosed with cervicogenic headaches? Primary headaches, such as receiving that diagnosis of migraine, which is a primary headache, basically refers to the headache itself as the problem. Now, this is one of the issues in our healthcare system, and when we look at diagnoses, migraine is seen as a standalone diagnosis, meaning it's almost as if there's there's not it's not necessary to search for something more because it's a primary headache. The headache is sort of originating from itself. It's, uh, it's hard to, it's, I mean, it's hard for me to even explain it because I don't totally understand it. I don't totally understand why that's okay, 
um, why we can just clump it into a, a primary headache category um, without continuing to search for the underlying problem. Uh, see, in my mind, we should uh, consider all headaches as secondary headaches because we want to know the origin of it. We don't want things to just come out of thin air as our healthcare system uh, uses that explanation to explain where headaches, or uh, excuse me, migraines come from. Uh, they'll say it's a spontaneous neurological event. So primary headache means it just, it originates out of thin air. The headache is the problem. There's no reason to search for something that's the underlying issue that's causing that pain because then it'd be a secondary headache. And secondary headaches are things like cervicogenic headaches where you have a neck problem and then it refers pain into your head. In general, uh, the, the percentages range here, but it's 2% to 36% of patients with headaches Will, ex will have a cervicogenic headache, okay? Now, that's significant because even if it's 36%, it's still a minority. Where in our practice with, let's say, 750 people that have gone through our system so far, um, it's probably actually substantially higher than that. Um, these are in-person patients though, but people that have gone through our in-person process uh, the, the number of them that have had a neck issue that's then referring pain to their head is probably in the 90%-ish range, okay? Now, the people that don't necessarily have pain referring to their head, uh, it's not as if they don't have any neck problem at all. It's just that they are, when we work on their neck, it's not a direct connection to their head. Uh, working on their neck is still proves to be valuable in their plan of care. And that's, that's a tangent to go down. But my point is that with what we're seeing in a, in a specialized headache center that's focused on treating neck problems, it's like virtually everyone has this neck problem when they have headaches. But the data out there, if we take this at face value and say, okay, cervicogenic headache is the secondary headache where migraine is not. So Migraine means like you shouldn't really have a neck problem, but uh, if you have a cervicogenic headache, you do have a neck problem. And cervicogenic headaches are about, let's say, you know, anywhere from 2% to 36% of people. So most people aren't going to have a neck-related headache, okay? A cervicogenic headache, a headache that originates from the neck. Now, when we talk about cervicogenic headaches, I'll get to this at the later end of the podcast, but there are things that you can utilize, there are ways to think about a cervicogenic headache and how I would define a cervicogenic headache that will help you guys understand if your neck is really, really like driving your symptoms, all right? So I wanna make that clear, but for the sake of like overarching, like how do we understand how, like what our diagnosis means, what cervicogenic headache means, um, it's helpful to know that it, in, in my perspective, in my experience, it's far more common um, than what the internet is uh, telling us. So why is it overlooked? Well, to receive the diagnosis of a cervicogenic headache, and I feel like I keep saying that and it's probably gonna become obnoxious, but maybe I'll say neck-related headache, is if you see your primary care doctor and they ask you to turn your head, look up and down, side to side, so they have you go through full range of motion, which is probably just turning your head. It might not even be that, um, but hopefully they're having you at least uh, do active range of motion of your neck. If you are able to do that and you don't have pain and it, and it looks like it's relatively normal, great, you don't have a neck problem. If you don't present with pain in your neck, meaning you don't directly tell the physician my neck hurts and then I get a headache, they are likely not going to consider your neck uh, as a major issue. And part of that is they don't necessarily know what to do past the point of range of motion and maybe an x-ray. Uh, but as we've talked about, it's movement. Movement is the problem. So that's how it's overlooked. Very few people, I would say the minor minority, so the 2% to the 36%, are actually going to their primary care doctor and they're saying, my neck hurts here, and then it shoots up and around. But I know it's my neck, when I turn my head like this, it reproduces it, and my neck is the problem, okay? So when people 
go to their primary care doc and they say that, and the primary care doctor is aware of this diagnosis of cervicogenic headache, then they may receive, the patient may receive that diagnosis. And that is my explanation for why the percentages are so low. That scenario is relatively unique. Even people that uh, have dealt with headaches, migraines for decades, they know they have a neck problem because they have not had anyone validate that their neck could be the actual issue. And because, you know, whether it's WebMD, the Mayo Clinic's website, like these websites that people frequently go to, it doesn't necessarily say, okay, there's, there's, it's hard to connect. You have a migraine or you have a headache, you have a splitting pain on one side of your head, you have a, a sharp stabbing pain on one side of the head. Um, it's going to be hard to connect that to, and it's coming from your neck, or do you have a neck problem as well? Those two things are generally separate, okay? So people don't think that way, and so for you to walk into a primary care doctor's office, it's probably because you found something like the Headache Doctor podcast, and, uh, and now you're like, oh yeah, my neck um, could very well be the problem here, okay? So the thing that's crazy, this is crazy, this is crazy. It's crazy because cervicogenic headaches can basically provide the exact same symptoms as a migraine, all right? Now, <clears throat> I, <laughs> those of you listening, first off, um, with all of my podcasts, just know I'm never, never trying to minimize your situation at all, okay? Migraines are debilitating, and I've talked about this before, but having the diagnosis of migraine I think is helpful. I believe it's helpful, um, not because it provides you with a solution, because it's, it doesn't, and I don't think it's helpful in that regard. I think it's actually harmful, but it's helpful in the sense that you have a framework to communicate to providers and to friends and to family members of this pain is debilitating, and you can't see it. My arm's not chopped off, but I cannot function right now. That's why it's important. It's different than just a regular headache. It's a migraine and you cannot function. It's putting you down. Life is gonna be very, very difficult to go on. Okay, that's why it's important. It's not important for getting you the answers that you're looking for. And the evidence of that is that you're listening to a podcast of a guy rather than your primary care doctor and your neurologist helping you find the relief, okay? So I'm imagining that's your story if you're listening to this. All right, so back to the camp of trying to find you relief. Cervicogenic headache can provide, now this is in the literature, um, there's data to show this. So even when we're taking the person that has the distinct, my neck hurts and it travels up and around one side of the head, maybe rest behind the eye, which is how a cervicogenic headache um, presents itself. Does that sound similar to a migraine? It does to me. Uh, the, the pain can be intense. You can have pain uh, in your arm or your shoulders. So the pain can refer down one side. You can have a sense of feeling ill, uh, off. You can be sensitive to bright lights. You can be sensitive to uh, uh, sounds, loud noises. You can even have a visual disturbance. Your vision can go blurry. Okay, so years ago, when I was starting to treat people with headaches, I was treating cervicogenic headaches, okay? Patients with migraine symptoms and the migraine diagnosis who had seen neurologist would come into the practice. And initially I thought, wait, this migraine is different because that's what I've been told. And so because you have migraine, that makes me nervous and you need to see a neurologist. Well, they told me, I've seen several neurologists, I've tried all these meds and uh, my neck hurts and I know I have a neck problem. Okay, well, let's treat your neck to their neck, and it improved. Now, that caused me to become curious about this whole paradigm, uh, this whole migraine paradigm. So what I did was I looked up, okay, now could the neck really cause someone's vision to be disturbed? Could the neck really cause you to have numbness and tingling? Could the neck really cause you to have sensitivities to lights and sounds? Like, that seems a little bit odd. But turns out cervicogenic headache can do all those things. So 
if the migraine diagnosis is based off of symptoms, meaning there's nothing objective that you're getting uh, as far as here's the test that uh, confirms that you have migraine, no, that's not happening. They're, they're basically just receiving your words, your symptoms, how you describe your pain, and then telling you, okay, this is the category it fits in, all right? A lot, of phys- uh, a lot of physicians are unaware of the cervicogenic diagnosis and not they're not very good at, at evaluating the neck, okay? So the fact that cervicogenic headache, you receiving that diagnosis, the chance of that is very low, and you tell them, I have a one-sided throbbing, pounding sensation, and it starts back here and it wraps up and around, it rests behind my eye, which again is a very common referral pattern for cervicogenic headache. Um, my vision goes blurry and I'm really sensitive to lights and sounds. What does that sound like? It sounds like a migraine. So what, what it, in, this, in this scenario of our current healthcare system and how things are set up, what do you think is gonna happen? Well, you're probably gonna get the diagnosis of migraine, but as we talked about initially, that's a primary headache disorder, meaning medication. It's not a secondary thing. That's not a neck problem. A migraine is not a neck problem, okay? And so that's that's the issue. I hope you all are seeing this. And it's it comes, I'm, I'm poking at this because it, it comes from a place of like, that's not helpful and we need to provide things that are helpful. So it frustrates me to no end. So um, primary headache, secondary headache, so what do we do with um, this information? And am I saying that like there's no such thing as a migraine? Is everything a cervicogenic headache? Well, what I wanna do is provide sort of a framework, um, maybe a series of questions that we can sort of set aside. So we're, we're gonna take our diagnoses and we're gonna just set them to the side for a second. So it doesn't matter uh, what your diagnosis is. It could be migraine, it could be migraine with aura, without aura, uh, it could be hemiplegic migraine, um, it could be cluster headache. It could So whatever, whatever your diagnosis is, let's just set it aside for a second. And let's ask some questions um, and see if this describes you and we'll, we'll just kind of, um, yeah, I, I want to see if this is helpful to you. So first off, let me know if this describes you if you don't have an objective finding connected to your symptoms, okay? So if there, if you've gone through a healthcare system and no one has said, hey, this specific thing that we can remove or that we can fix or that we can, whatever, like if that, if, if there hasn't been that objective thing, okay? If your diagnosis was based on symptoms, meaning what I just said, you have a one-sided pain and it um, is intermittent, it's throbbing, it's debilitating, so that's a diagnosis, and then you received a diagnosis. Um, that would be a diagnosis based on symptoms, and they have provided you just with medication so far. All right, so if that describes you, then this is helpful because what we wanna do is take you from this sort of ambiguous, uh, I don't know what is actually causing this, and put you in the category of like, let's start to ask some specific questions that will be helpful for your situation. All right, so do you have neck pain? Does the base of your skull hurt? Does your head feel heavy? Do you have neck pain with your migraine? Do your symptoms increase with prolonged sitting, certain head positions, movements? Uh, Do you sleep on your stomach and wake up with a headache or a migraine? Do you push on your neck to relieve your symptoms? All right. And this last one, if you push on your neck and that relieves your symptoms, it's just, uh, it's almost like frustratingly obvious and um, painful because I <laughs> I wish this is a problem that was being solved. And uh, patients come to me all the time and they're like, yeah, I push here and that relieves it. And it just feels like if as providers we are trained to truly listen to our patient, like that would be indication enough uh, to say, hey, you have a neck issue. Let's let's try to figure this out. Okay. So again, setting the diagnosis aside, kind of our preconceived notions of you know I don't have a neck problem. Migraine is different than the neck, and just answer those questions. Now, if me asking those questions, you're like, no, my neck doesn't hurt at all. 
I have no pain in the base of my skull. When I have a migraine, my neck feels great. My head does not feel heavy. Um, I don't push on my neck to try to relieve my symptoms. I will say that we still, um, we still have patients that can say no to all those and they still have a neck problem and um, we work on them and they get better. But uh, those questions for most people should be enlightening in the sense of like, oh yeah, like that does describe me. That is what I'm going through. I connect with that, okay? So those are the questions we should be asking because they provide us with solutions. They provide us with a plan of care. They provide us with the source, all right? And that's what cervicogenic headache is, is a diagnosis that allows an avenue for us to treat something, that secondary headache, meaning the headache isn't the problem, it's, it's the neck, it's coming from the neck, all right? So when we um, are evaluating someone, it's, uh, first off, it's, it's less important to hear exactly what diagnosis and category people have put in. It's more important to ask those questions. And so as we're going through the process, that's generally what we will ask you, things like that. But I will say that a, in, in our world, if I'm gonna, if I'm gonna use the, the term cervicogenic headache in talking to uh, Dr. Muir, Dr. Gutwein, that, um, the other providers that work here, what I'll do is, uh, or what I'll be referring to, and it, this is more specific, but it's, um, there's a category of patients where they have more of a specific, like one single spot, and generally it's a joint in the neck that is angry and irritated. And that, in my mind, would be more like, that's a true cervicogenic headache patient, because um, if we address that one single spot that's sending pain into their head, and usually it's a dominant one-sided presentation, so it's always on your right, it starts in your neck, top part of the neck, base of the skull, and it wraps up and around, rests behind your eye, maybe it's a sharp stabbing pain, uh, dull throbbing, just whatever the pain is like, it's in one side of the head and kind of in that ram's horn presentation. That in my mind is a, is a more specific cervicogenic di headache diagnosis as opposed to like a tension type headache, which is a strap uh, across both sides, more in the frontal part of the head and generated from just general m muscle tension as opposed to a specific joints th joint that's really irritated. Cervicogenic headaches will most of the time respond really well to chiropractic care. So if you've gone to a chiropractor and you leave and you're like, wow, that really helped, but then it comes back pretty quick, it's likely that um, that cervicogenic headache category really fits well for you, okay? It's, uh, if we can address the one specific joint and in our world, we want it to move. In the chiropractic world, they're you know trying to align it. But uh, basically, when someone comes in and tells us that, we know like there's a really really good chance you're going to succeed with what we're doing, because your body's already shown us that if we change the amount of stress through your neck, you're going to feel better. So the other thing is if you um, push on your neck, so the upper part of the neck, if you have a headache and you push up here and you kind of feel muscle tension, a little knot there and that pressure there seems to relieve it, uh, that's also a really good sign that um, there's a specific spot in your neck that's causing your head pain, uh, which we would refer to as a cervicogenic headache um, in the sense that, not that if it's not a cervicogenic headache, it's not coming from your neck, but what we're communicating to each other is there's a very specific site and a very specific pattern that's coming from the neck. Uh, so there's, our specific way of looking at it, which basically, yeah, like I said, um, sort of directs us in how we're gonna view treatment for this patient. But in the general scheme of things, cervicogenic headaches in a broad sense, meaning a headache that comes from the neck, I think the percentage of people, I believe the percentage of people that have a neck problem leading to head pain is very, very high. Um, and uh, if, if you could answer, and especially if you answered those questions uh, positively, uh, the first three and then, and then the last set of them, I, I would say, um, let's, let's explore the neck. And aside from your diagnosis, uh, that's, 
like that's how we think. That's how we want to structure your plan of care because we want to ask the questions that then lead us to a treatment that provides answers to the source and then leads to the result. All right, so that's cervicogenic headache. Uh, if you had heard of it before, um, and this I hope this was just more information, more helpful. Uh, if you hadn't heard of it before, I hope this is changing your perspective and you're starting to think differently. One thing that can be helpful is if you use this term to communicate to providers, it will communicate to them that you are saying you have a neck problem that's leading to a headache, okay? Sometimes if you say I have a headache and it comes from my neck, uh, for some reason it's different than saying I have a cervicogenic headache. Having a cervicogenic headache might unleash some more opportunity when you communicate to different providers and uh, you can even ask, do you think I have a cervicogenic headache and see what your provider says. Hey guys, thank you so much for listening to the Headache Doctor podcast. That concludes this episode. I had a lot of fun. I love doing this. It's just, um, I, I, I truly, I'm just so passionate about helping you all. And uh, I hope that's how it's coming across is helpful. Uh, we have people that fly out um, all over the country to come see us, people who've listened to this podcast. Uh, and I do want you to share, uh, leave a five-star review because that definitely helps promote this information so that we can continue to help more people break free from a life of fear of their next headache or migraine and dependence on medication. Thank you so much. I'll see you next week.